welcome to another remote edition of Currently in Quincy. I'm Joe Catalano. On today's program, we'll chat with Quincy State Representative Tacky Chan about some state house legislation. First, though, we check out the news for you. Currently in Quincy, there are 1,241 cases of coronavirus confirmed in the city. That's only four more than on Friday. There have been 126 deaths. That's only one additional since Friday, and there have been 1,012 recoveries here in Quincy. Statewide, there are now over 105,000 confirmed cases of the virus. Quincy City Council will meet remotely again tonight, and they are expected to approve the $340 million budget for the next fiscal year that begins on July 1st. Mayor Thomas Koch says the goal of the mostly level-funded budget is for no property tax increase in the fall and no major budget cuts. Officials are expecting an answer tonight on the question of whether the city will have to pay about $2.5 million in health insurance costs for Quincy College employees as the college struggles financially. A counselor at large, Ann Mahoney, said at a recent meeting that the city should have a better handle on Quincy College finances. I'm just going to say this. It's very disconcerting to me that we keep saying it's a department of the city, but when we ask the question about the OPED, the OPED, you didn't know because as a department of the city, I would expect that we know where the financials are coming from from Quincy College. If we're going to treat it like a department, then we should understand where our expenses are and what the liability is to our city. So I am concerned about that, but I know that we'll have a special meeting about that at some point to really dig into it. Quincy College is still considered a department of the city, although it is operating self-sustaining in its budgets. Construction continues on the new General's Bridge in Quincy Center. Recently, crews completed the demolition of the building that houses the Commonwealth Restaurant and Lounge to make way for that new bridge that will link Hancock Street with the Bergen Parkway through Cliveden Street over the MBTA tracks. Now, the bridge is expected to be dedicated next Memorial Day. In other work, crews are still in the process of rebuilding the Dennis Ryan Parkway in front of the courthouse. That project includes new sidewalks, curbing, and lighting. And a reminder, too, the Cottage Avenue is closed to vehicular traffic every day at 2 p.m. to allow for outdoor dining at local restaurants. Motorists will be able to access the new parking garage there 24 hours a day. A Quincy teenager who had been missing for over two weeks has been located. 17-year-old Max Burley Martinez was found safe this past Friday after she disappeared on June 4th. A police had appealed to the public for help in finding the girl because she has a medical condition and didn't take her medicine with her when she vanished. Details about her whereabouts were not available. However, police say Martinez was found unharmed and they did thank the public for their assistance. The Boston law firm of Breakstone, White, and Glock has once again donated bicycle helmets to the Quincy Police Department to be handed out to the public. Uh, 200 helmets were recently donated as part of the firm's Kids Safe Campaign 2020. The firm founded that campaign back in 2013 and has distributed more than 30,000 helmets to various organizations. This year, the firm has donated 4,000 helmets to police departments, schools, community groups, and bicycle committees. Those helmets are being distributed on a first-come, first-served basis and are available in small, medium, and large sizes. You should contact Quincy Police Sergeant Karen Barkas for all the details. Coming up, we'll have a chat with State Representative Jackie Chan of Quincy. That's next. The year 2020 will certainly be a memorable one, for better or worse. While it seems the COVID-19 pandemic has brought the world to a standstill, life does go on. Whether you're working from home, trying to buy groceries, or keeping the kids entertained, life in Quincy continues, just in a different fashion. As life continues, it needs to be documented. In order to document and preserve life during the pandemic, the City of Quincy, the Thomas Crane Public Library, Quincy 400, and Quincy Access Television have partnered to form Quincy COVID Memories, a project to gather, document, and share stories and experiences of people living everyday life during the pandemic. We're asking you to share stories, photos, videos, and more that best represent your experiences during this unprecedented time. 
Your submission can be simple, but say a lot. Like this photo of a husband, a frontline worker, leaving for work at 5.30 a.m. Asked if he might step back during the time, he rejected the idea and said, someone's got to do it. Or this photo of a family out for a walk, just with added protection of face masks. Or this video of a family celebrating the 89th birthday of a loved one. These submissions tell the story of life during the pandemic. Help add to the story with your daily life. Visit www.quincyculturalmemory.com to submit your story today. Nice to check in again with uh, State Representative Jackie Chan of Quincy for uh, our weekly Beacon Hill updates, if we will. Hey, Jackie, nice to see you. Hey, Joe, it's great to see you, too. We're continuing to be another week of talking heads. Yeah, that's absolutely right. People getting really uh, interested in our dining rooms and our bedrooms <laughs> and see what's going on in the background. <laughs> I had to learn all about Zoom lighting one day. <laughs> Is... um. Is the house back at uh, the state house at all? No, uh, I haven't been visiting the state house for a couple of weeks. Um, I was in there to get some law books, and uh, my actually my staff helped out and got me some my plants back home um, that are, has been suffering. Um, so, for, no, it's been pretty much a quiet building. They're running on a skeleton crew, essential personnel only to operate sessions. Uh, but even a lot of these uh, speaker staff is working remotely coming in only when necessary. Um, and those who actually look at the legislature's website and see it, uh, some of the pictures of the membership, I mean, there are a lot of older folks uh, that are high vulnerability risk to COVID-19 uh, that are elected. Um, so, you know, after the complications, some people have campaigns this year. It's hard to see people right now, and if you're uh, immune compromised uh, and older, uh, much older or some combination, it, it's going to be a challenging cycle. Yeah, I, know that I think, is it the Senate that's starting to ease back into it just a little bit? Yes. Uh, here's the funny thing. Uh, someone had to go first and trying to find a method to hold a session. So the House went first. So the Senate is actually taking some lessons from the House, and they're adjusting the rules again um, this week to, uh, to do some of the things we've been doing to try to uh, smooth out their process and keep themselves and their staff safe uh, in the midst of all this. Um, as the people see in the news, Boston has been uh, seeing a lot of the protesters. Um, as you heard from all the uh, doctors and immunologists, that uh, an epidemic, epidemiologists, uh, that the uh, spread of the virus uh, is a high possibility because of the continuous close contact with other people uh, as part of the protest. And you know, the ads all over Boston Common and the State House, and they're very unavoidable. So. Um, you know, we, we want to keep ourselves safe as well. We, you know, encourage everyone's first amendment's rights. You know, we try to also reduce the uh, chances of uh, people catching it, especially the, the older members. Right. Uh, as we've learned from this, younger members can be um, carriers and not even know it, and then um, you know, bring it home to folks who are, are more vulnerable. So, uh, using all the precautions uh, that are dictated is just wise. Yep. Yeah, yeah, it's a risk. Risk based on time. The longer you have a Exposure to a possibility of someone with COVID increases your odds of catching. To that end, can we talk a little bit about um, a discussion on Beacon Hill regarding these protests and, and how they might impact uh, policing in Massachusetts going forward? Yes, the governor revealed a proposal on an outline more accurately uh, during the news regarding uh, uniform uh, police standards, uh, some training issues, and so forth. The Speaker of the House working the Black Latino Caucus and I had to inject myself because obviously I'm not black Latino uh, as part of the conversation uh, to uh, talk about, again, uh, police standards and training and uh, banning a certain uh, procedures such as chokeholds, which is making its way throughout the country, whether it be a dictate from the police department as an internal policy or by the legislature uh, on the council level or state legislature's level uh, to engage in that conversation. And my colleague, Liz Miranda, 
who's a freshman rep uh, out of the Dorchester area, has filed legislation to uh, basically dictate police policy. And I'll be frank with you, I'm still learning as I go on this stuff, um, as I'm willing to go on a lot of other things uh, coming across my table, on my bedroom desk, more accurately. Hmm. Um, and uh, they're uh, talking about, again, police procedures, um, better evaluation of uh, mental health issues and potentially other uh, need of help for police officers, um, the under duress, better identification, things like that. Uh, but also, I think you've seen the news talk about not shooting people in the back, for example, and uh, unless you can demonstrate some imminent danger, uh, which I find to be a very challenging term to put in something in statute, right? And what defines an imminent danger or threat to yourself and others. And I think that's, that's going to be very difficult to put into law. Uh, but I understand the premise of it. You know, same thing on restraint. You shouldn't have to use deadly restraint unless it's absolutely positively necessary. I mean, if you have four uh, against one, one would hope that you could figure something out. Uh, if we have superior numbers versus one versus four, and you're a police officer in danger. Uh, so, you know, there's um, in different circumstances, and they're trying to uh, legislate some police policies to do that. They also talk about um, ideas regarding uh, following police records on a personnel level. So one of the concerns that's been presented is that if you have a, a bad actor who's been disciplined or at least reported many times in one police department, the leaves are transferred to another police department, it's almost like a clean slate. So unless somebody pipes up from the other place to the new place, nobody knows what your uh, potential issues were. Uh, prior uh, that were investigated, even if you're cleared, the fact that complaints filed, uh, you know, maybe there was nothing really going on. It was perfectly fine. The, the complaints were false, or conversely, the complaints were very legitimate, and uh, your new employee should uh, should know about those complaints, especially since you're in law enforcement, you have a firearm, you have uh, a high responsibility to the public to keep us safe, it's also responsible to the public, and, and all the other things our police officers do that are great for us. So, you know, there's a lot of conversations on a broad level on, on every front um, from police procedures to training to um, some more accountability and transparency. Yeah, I was kind of surprised to learn Massachusetts is, well, I guess, one of only four states where police officers aren't, you know, quote unquote, licensed by, by the state. Uh, although uh, I believe the training requirements here in the state are, are far superior than, than in other states. Well, we agree with that. I mean, we, we do uh, a better job than other places. But, for example, I didn't realize that um, until this week that there's no uniform training academy. So the city of Boston and the city of Lowe, both of them do not use the state training academy for the police officers. They engage in an alternative training academy. The MBTA police do not use the uniform training academy of the state. So they may have uniform policies, but they have to be – uh, specific, you know, some of them do not want to pay for or participate. I didn't also realize that um, uh, certain uh, police officers do not have to go through training again to work in a uh, different uh, police department. So, for example, if you're um, one police officer trained in one way, you come uh, to, to another community and your police was trained in a different academy, uh, there is no requirement for you to be trained in, in the academy of the municipality you're working in. Um, and uh, I didn't realize that. Um, the other thing that I didn't quite realize uh, was that even though there's, uh, we like to have some uniform training, uh, what does this training look like? And mm -hmm. I actually don't know yet. I just, these are things I'm trying to learn. Um, and uh, I, you know, advocated to the speaker's office to remind them that you got to be cautious of the one size fit all approach. So a smaller town. A police force has a different challenge than a large city police force. Yeah, different crimes, uh, different geographic zones because of road systems, um, and of course, different uh, population demographics. So we have a large uh, non-English speaking population that you have to uh, help and protect. And it has a different uh, than a small rural community. So, you know, this is part of the challenges of a uniform police training that we really have to have as part of our conversation. Right. Yeah. It might be a, a combination of both, you know, uniform training plus individualized community training uh, on top of that too. That's correct. There are higher violent crimes in, in certain counties and certain communities and others. And you've been a police officer for 
a long period of time in a, uh, let's say, 10 years in a low violent crime area and find ourselves in a high violent crime area, it's a whole different ball game of training and stress levels mm-hmm. and all that. You know, so same thing. You go from a very uh, engaged community and you go to a, a less um, engaged area. It has a whole different issue too. So this is kind of part of the danger of one size fit all. But I do understand there's a need for these some uniform training so that you know, when there's a look at uh, practice and standards, we have a benchmark to look at as opposed to have to like fix, pick up the benchmarks of every single different group. Yeah. How are, are the um, state police trained, Tacky? What, what's the protocols there? They have a state police training academy. Okay. So we are kind of like statewide licensed mm-hmm. because of the uh, requirement they have to at least follow the statewide training methods. So, I mean, that's kind of part of it as well. Um, and But the licensing issue is, I'm hearing a little bit from, from law enforcement's concern because that's your bread and butter livelihood. If you're licensed revoked, it's licensed statewide. You can't mm-hmm. work anywhere else. Right. Which is an interesting question, right? The question becomes, if you are a, uh, unable to meet the license requirements, so to speak, or already requirements of protocol uh, or the training requirements or whatever you want to call it, um, you know, you're going to be denied work in any of the police department. But if you failed the police procedures in one place and you quit before they terminate you and you work in another place, I mean, that's an interesting question also, right? Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. You know, yeah. And, uh, you know, the other side is you know, provide a reference. So, you know, obviously, you know, we have a right to look at uh, any of the person's prior employment on the resume and make a phone call and say, hey, you know, what was the deal with this guy? You know, you're looking to hire, what's your opinion? Right. The question is, you know, should law enforcement provide that same opinion. Yeah. I guess, you know, how much do you think race, though, play, plays a part in, in how this discussion came about when it comes to, to policing and, and police motivation? Well, I acknowledge the fact that, you know, police can do bad things to people that are not uh, people of color. I mean, they, you know, people who are, are white can be brutalized by police. I mean, uh, people, it's not like I hear complaints just from uh, specific demographics, mm-hmm. but it's been magnified in the news because of this portion of statistics associated with uh, particularly black people associ- uh, in uh, prison systems, a lot of poor offenses, uh, there's more video cam of, of other states. Um, I don't speak to Massachusetts directly. It's really a lot of other states who are watching the news and the uh, procedures associated with it. Um, but, I mean, I also want to remind folks uh, there are other uh, people that are impacted. Mm-hmm. Uh, disproportional numbers by statistics is very disproportional in the black community. And that's, that's hard to deny. And as more uh, footage comes up of uh, body cameras and people coming forward about their experiences, I hope it allows other people who had bad experiences, whoever they are, uh, to also come forward and say, hey, yeah, this happened to me too. Uh, and, and bring very to light to this issue. Uh, whether the media covers those stories, well, I don't control what the media covers. Um, and I agree this is a huge tragedy, um, and um, I don't know what to say anymore about it. I mean, it speaks for itself. Um, but what I'm hoping is that, you know, through this, uh, uh, George Floyd and many other people who whose family has been very badly impacted, as well as these protests, you know, helps other people willing to come forward and say, hey, this impacted me also. Yeah, it might be a, a second wave of the, the Me Too movement, if you will, uh, when it comes to this particular issue. Well, any one of us can potentially be a victim of anything. Mm-hmm. And, uh, you know, one of the things that we don't want to have is having uh, uh, the, uh, sorry, my phone has buzzed. Let me get this the buzzer because I know I watched myself last time and noticed the buzzing. <laughs> um, but I mean, none of us should be subject to uh, unfair treatment. Yeah. Or, uh, treatment that is um, frankly hurtful, uh, physically hurtful, emotionally hurtful by people that we trust to keep us safe. Even if I do something wrong, you know, I trust that I'll be, be treated well and humanely, uh, regardless of anything else. Sure. And like I said, I mean, they have a superior position. They're, they're the police officers. They have, they're a 
they have authority uh, that none of us have. Yeah, that's they are enforcers, you know, uh, uh, by by mandate enforcing a law that's been that's been enacted by by the people. I um, mean, theory. Well, there's also peacekeepers as a way to put it too. They here to keep the peace, and uh, we want to be, you know, trust more trust that they you know, keep us all safe. Whether you're um, someone that uh, has done nothing wrong or someone that has done something wrong, either way. We talk a little bit about, um, I'm curious about how voting is going to happen um, this year in Tacky in this, in this coronavirus age. I know the, the city clerk not so long ago, she's waiting for some guidance and, and whether or not there'll be uh, elections by mail, whether there'll be early absentee voting, um, you know, uh, how it's all going to pan out in, in September. Well, we're waiting for the Senate to uh a vote on uh, their proposal for a uh, mailing this September and November. Um, the House did a, a pass a bill uh, last week. Uh, actually, we talked about it actually a little bit last week. Uh, and the idea is we're going to do a non excuse absentee ballot, I meaning you don't need an ex- ex- reason to get an absentee ballot. Mm-hmm. Uh, we were required that the Secretary of State mail everybody this form saying if you'd like to vote, uh, mail this back to the clerk's office, as well as provide a way to do it online. And, Obviously, you can call the clerk yourself to get a form um, and then proceed to um, send it back and mail your ballot. Um, and the ballot being postmarked by day of will count. And uh, we'll also want to have the clerks be able to process ballots as they come in and secure them. So we let them figure out how to do that at their level. Um, okay. Have really voting in our primary, um, do at least one Saturday or weekend day voting yeah. of the primary and final and to uh, obviously you know proper health care sanitation of polling places i do not think we have to instruct anyone to do that um but i mean we put in the law just for the comfort of people to know that we're requiring it even though i'm very confident that uh everybody is and will be and should be uh doing good health care practices no matter where they are Right, and even post-pandemic, hopefully, uh, that'll be uh, one of the lasting positive impacts uh, from this whole experience. Oh, I hope so. I still cannot get over the fact that I have to teach people to wash their hands. <laughs> just to wash their hands as a child, and you know, given the nature of uh, my line of work, I engage in a lot of handshaking, a lot of physical contact, mm. so uh, frequent hand washing and uh, being conscientious of my surroundings is, is very important. Yeah. Um, how, in your estimation, how is, uh, you know, phase two going in Massachusetts and, and, um, you know, what is it that we can learn from other countries that have already uh, passed this particular phase? Um, well, there's basically two lessons in other countries. One is you just open up or two new phase open up. Um, a lot of the heavily hit countries that have uh, gone through the top end of the curve and the, the you know, descending section of the curve have done very slow phased openings. And they're very, very cautious about this. You know, some places, for example, Hong Kong move from, you know, four people at a restaurant, period. So, I mean, you're trying to get up to 10, trying to move up to the next number. Um, same thing in Korea, although Korea has had three hot spots uh, in less than two weeks, and they've not proceeded to shut down certain areas of the um, country because they want to do massive contact tracing again. Um, people are... Uh, some have been behaving well in their private businesses because there's a personal responsibility, which I keep repeating myself, and some have been more challenged. And some other countries which are looking to open economies up sooner than later uh, are still in a high spike. And if you watch national news, same thing's happening in the United States. Yeah. So um, monitoring continues to be very, very important for all countries. Um, I hope you know, people understand that here in the United States also, monitoring is very important uh, to try to um, make sure that uh, they are not having to do massive lockdowns, but maybe short lockdowns here and there to do proper contact tracing. Also remind folks that countries like Indonesia has now become the second highest death rate in um, Asia, and it's a warm weather country of 270 million people, and uh, their healthcare system is nothing like ours, much uh, less adequate, to be honest mm-hmm. with you. And uh, they try to do a phase reopening despite the rising death count, and they've been pausing as they go along. Uh, trying to figure out they're one of the late, unfortunately, late responders to this uh, pandemic. Brazil has rapidly moved to the top five of death count. 
smaller country than ours, other warm weather country. Uh, at, uh, healthcare system is already been overwhelmed. A lot of dense populations, and the president who continues to uh, defy the existence of the disease, which resulted in health ministers resigning. Um, so, when you're looking at vid, uh, news footage of people building mass graves in advance of uh, actual death count, that's not reassuring. And uh, Mexico has done that as well. They've been building mass graves in advance. Hmm. So locally, I did a little drive around on Wednesday. Had a run to Evans. Um, I've seen more restaurants open for takeout at minimum that were not open before. Mm -hmm. uh, I've seen uh, more storefronts opening, uh, but also providing opportunities for delivery, mail delivery, in-person delivery, or uh, scheduled pickups. Um, people know that I'm a comic book guy, um, and I've been able to work in my own comic book store to uh, try to get stuff. But even in their case, uh, they are limiting number of people to store and a limiting number of people that can browse through the rack. So if you're a comic book collector, part of the relaxation, fun part of it is to look at the books there, flip through a few, figure out what you want to buy. Yeah. There was people from actually standing in the rack. You actually have to take what you want to look and browse and move to a different part of the store. So people are taking this very seriously. Um, and uh, I'm sure many are. The Simon's Mall is open this week. They opened new malls in yeah. Massachusetts. And uh, not surprising, very slow attendance so far. But it's also a weekday opening. Saturday is tomorrow. Today is Friday and Sunday. And you know, maybe there'll be a higher volume of people coming in, but they have to self-police, essentially, the number of people coming through. And each store has to self-police on the in the store. So it's going to be a challenge. But, you know, wait, you know, no mass, no service. I see those signs everywhere. Mm -hmm. Like I said, no shoes, no shirt, no, you know, no service. Now you just add one more line. No shoes, yeah. no shirt. No mass, no service. Yeah. Um, do you think, Tacky, that you know the state is prepared for a second wave of the virus in the fall if if it happens? Yeah, I think we'll be in good shape uh, for a second wave. I mean, the longer preparation, the first wave for a worst case scenario uh, was wildly successful, despite the fact that we still have a massive tragedy of seven thousand people passing away. Despite. Yeah. Despite all that, I think the place that we need to do prepare for is the place where 60% of people die, which is our assisted living facilities and nursing homes. We have to do a better job there. Um, and it's been an ongoing process of Secretary Sutter's uh, to encourage, incentivize, and I think down the road, we're going to start issuing fines and penalties or something uh, to, uh, to these facilities to come up to grade. Mm -hmm. um, obviously, we're not fighting and penalizing anybody now. We're trying to do it financial incentives and uh, more inspections to check in on them to make sure everything's okay. Right. But you know, two thirds of all your deaths come from uh, those facilities. We have to definitely do uh, better oversight. The governor has required hospitals to maintain COVID sections. Okay. We're still in the prep. We still are uh, sitting on a supply of ventilators. We're building our own PPE supply up at the state level, as well as individual facilities are building, continue to build PPE up as well uh, in anticipation of a uh, possible second surge. And our frontline guys, including Community Health Center, man, the Community Health Center, they've been on the front line for this whole thing, trying to take care of patients and also to uh, take COVID patients and do COVID testing, as well as the CVS and Walgreens also doing COVID testing. Yeah. And contact yeah. trade. The few schools have been closed, but have they been dismantled or are they still uh, put together just in case? I think, uh, I'm trying to remember correctly, I think they're going to be taken down, but they're going to be on basically standby. We know how to put them up quick now. Right, okay. So much thanks to the National Guard, you know, city workers, convention center workers, state workers, you know, all these folks that know how to work together short notice to put together a triage centers or you know, emergency centers such as the one in the Foxborough area, uh, the DC uh, center, um, mm -hmm. DC center. Um, I get the bank wrong in my head again. Uh, yeah. <laughs> the Boston Convention Center. Yeah. Um, given how we do that in a short period of time, uh, once again, lesson learned. God forbid there's a huge second wave. Uh, we are uh, better situated to rapid respond again. Yeah. Before we go, a um, good, good place to end, I guess, is our census reminder, as we have been doing uh, during these chats. Yeah, absolutely. The state continues to trend slightly against the country. We're 63% as a state. But Quincy is 1% behind the state, so we're 62%. So uh, our neighbors around us, I don't have to say over and over again, at least 8 to 5 to 10 percentage points ahead of uh, Quincy. 
uh, in, in the account. They're actually ahead of us. Brain Chi, Wayne, Randolph, Milton, all are doing better than state average and much better than ours. So um, for uh, people who are, don't like to get more mail, uh, people in my district, because they can only mail uh, in my own district, uh, we'll be getting a reminder to fill out the census sometimes in the next two weeks. So uh, you know you're my constituent. Uh, you'll be listening to this because you're going to get a piece of mail, most likely, uh, to your name or current resident uh, if your address is in the residency book. Uh, to uh, to remind you to fill the census out. So please do uh, 2020census.gov. Great. Thanks, Zachy. It's great to see you. Uh, be well, and uh, we'll catch up again next week. Absolutely. Good to see you. Please be well, and we'll talk to you next week. All right. Bye-bye. Special thanks to State Representative Tacky Chan of Quincy for joining us today. Thank you to our crew working remotely from home, and thank you for watching. And a reminder to please do participate in the Quincy COVID Memories Project. Submit your photos, your videos, your artwork, any other stories of your life during the pandemic to quincyculturalmemory.com. Or you can send them to the Thomas Crane Library, Attention Local History, 40 Washington Street, Quincy, 02169. QATV, the library, the city, and Quincy 400 are all partnering up on this project to collect history of the pandemic, life in the city of Quincy during this time. So we ask you to please participate. And also, please do visit our newly redesigned website, QATV.org. you find the latest programs there along with news and information, video on demand, and now live streaming as well. For all of us here at Quincy Access Television, I'm Joe Catalano. Please stay safe.